What a distinct honor to be introduced to this distinguished group by Fred Lennon. I'm glad, I was proud when they said a distinguished businessman, and I think back, listen to the litany things he clicked off that I've been involved in my, in my life. But one of the things that I think really shaped my life the most was being in private business and participating in it, and I think therefore perhaps understanding with a certain keenness what it means to compete, what it means to take risks, what it means to have things go, go bad, and what it means to hopefully, when things are going well, add to the employment base of this country. So Fred, I'm most appreciative of your mentioning that. As for Barbara Bush, I'm going through a little withdrawal syndrome on her. Uh, she wanted to be here, but you see, here's what's happened. Our dog has written a book, and uh, Barbara has to be in Houston in the morning. We had planned to go from here, there, and then with my friend John Hammersmith, we're going on Air Force Two to Arkansas before I go to Texas, so she had to miss this, and I will tell her only partially of your glowing remarks because it's bad enough having a famous dog but when your wife is on an ascendancy as Barbara justifiably is it makes it extraordinarily difficult so I'll pass along your good wishes and leave it at that uh, as for Cliff White most of you know him and those of you who don't know, should know that this center is getting one of the outstanding political brains in this country and leaders to head up this fantastic center. So I want to pay my respects to Cliff and wish him well, and hopefully I can somewhere down the line be of help to him in this new work, just as he is of enormous help to the president now and to me collaterally uh, in what it is we're engaged in. I've been told that this is a strictly nonpartisan event that means I can't tell you my views on Tip O'Neill. And you got to realize I, uh, I have a special vantage point, as Phil knows. I sit up there at the State of the Union message, sitting right next to Tip. And uh, I keep getting calls from my mother saying, look, when the president is speaking, don't be looking off one side or the other. That's after she tells me my necktie didn't look right or something like this. And I finally told her, mother, I've got a special assignment. I'm watching Tip O'Neill, and he's sitting right there. And I've concluded something about him. He's a delightful person. He's got a marvelous sense of humor, as Phil knows. But he believes all these things he says. And that's what worries me about him. And it's taken me about six State of the Union messages to conclude this. As for Dr. Schultz, I want to say how pleased I am to be on the campus and back in this corner of the woods. As for Mrs. Ashbrook, Jean, I couldn't be happier to be here. She didn't eat a thing, thus putting me ashamed as I wolfed down the second parfait. But nevertheless, I, other than that, her performance here has been exemplary. And one of the real reasons, and I think it was Bill Rusher you got to blame in part for my being here, when he mentioned that I might have this pleasure of seeing her again and paying my respects to John as I'm about to do, why it was irresistible. And I'm just delighted to be here. I, Phyllis, I enjoyed your comments about Larry McDonald very much. And as for Phil Crane and John Hammerschmidt, two close friends of mine from the Congress, I feel honored that they're here. I will resist giving a political speech. It's wrong and for the time. But I really did come out here to tell you how I felt about John Ashbrook. It's been a couple of years now that have gone by since we lost our friend John. And for those who knew and worked with him, the loss really was, no matter how close, but the loss was deep and personal. But as President Reagan so eloquently pointed out here last year, there was a much greater loss when John passed away so suddenly and tragically. It was a loss to our country. It was a loss to the cause of freedom. And it was a loss to the conservative movement that paved the way for political revolution that took place in America four years ago. As one of the key figures in that revolution, John Ashbrook has been aptly compared to Tom Paine. 
at a time in our history when the liberal advocates of centralized government seem to dominate our national scene. John's was that insistent voice, the insistent voice of common sense, the clear voice that spoke out in the halls of Congress on behalf of individual freedom. And when he spoke out, as President Reagan noted when he inaugurated this Center for Public Affairs last May, he spoke out in a way, and here was a quote, that made the liberal establishment take notice. John Ashbrook, said the president, knew that the first duty of public life is to responsibly speak the truth, even if the moment's fashion is against the truth. For it's through such consistency and coherence, such constant attention to principle, that the public trust is eventually won and political consensus is mobilized. Consistency, coherence, and constant attention to principle. Those were the virtues that John Ashbrook brought to the American political scene and to the conservative cause for four decades, from the 1950s to the 1980s. As one of John's colleagues in the House, I know firsthand that he was recognized on both sides of the political aisle as a fierce but fair advocate, as a dedicated and tireless worker, as one of those rare individualists who would rather stand alone in fighting for what he thought to be right than compromise his beliefs. In a political environment where the prevailing wisdom is that a member of Congress ought to go along in order to get along, John's approach, as we know, didn't win him any kudos from the establishment, but it endeared him to the people whose opinions he cared about the most deeply, the men and women of Ohio's 17th District, who sent and kept him in Congress for over two decades. John Ashbrook, in every sense of the word, was a representative of the people, a grassroots leader, a congressman who was as close to his constituents on the day he passed away as he was on the day he was first elected. Never forgot once he came. John's political courage earned him another distinction as well. It widened his constituency to include thousands, indeed tens of thousands of supporters, not only in Ohio, but across the country. Republicans, Democrats, Independents alike, these men and women came to know and, and respect John for standing tall in the battle to preserve traditional American values, family, neighborhood, and work. And beyond these values, faith in God is the divine inspiration for the individual freedom we cherish. And this, then, was John Ashbrook, his friends and supporters, knew and admired. In an age of relativism, a man bold enough to believe in and speak out for clear, well-defined standards. In an age of quick fix solutions to world and national problems, a man strong enough to stand by his principles and seek answers based not on political expediency, but on what he believed to be in our country's long-range interests. In an age of cynicism and skepticism, a man who believed in the, in the potential of the human spirit, an optimist about America's future, who recognized the strength and vitality of our system and the essential fairness and decency of his fellow Americans. In an age of big government, a man who adhered with single-minded determination to the fundamental principle that the, that government is best which governs least. John's liberal critics, of course, would label him as a reactionary. Well, if holding fast to that philosophy of such 18th century minds as Jefferson and Madison, Hamilton and Mason makes a public figure a reactionary, then I guess John's critics were right. In that larger sense, he was a reactionary. 
But he was revolutionary as well, you see. A leader and a guiding light in a conservative revolution that few thought could possibly succeed when John Ashbrook entered public life a quarter of a century ago. And yes, as we all know, feel deeply, it was a tragedy that John should leave us so soon after the revolution he helped create had at long last come to Washington, when a president and an administration had begun the job of reducing the size of big government and, and zealously trying to bring power back to the people. But it would be doubly tragic if the contribution made by John Ashbrook were to be forgotten in the years to come. Thanks to Ashland College and the men and women who were inspired by John's example to stand up as he did for the ideals that he believed in so passionately, that contribution of his certainly will not be forgotten. And here on this campus, the memory of John Ashbrook is being is being kept alive in the way John himself would have wanted, by furnishing the intellectual resources to instruct young Americans in the philosophy of political, social, economic life that has made our country a bastion of freedom for over, over two centuries. The time when the liberals had a monopoly on developing intellectual centers to shape public policy has passed. And that, too, is a part of the revolution that John Ashbrook helped to foster. He understood that to the need to spread the gospel of freedom, as it were, to sow the intellectual seeds that would create a conservative harvest in the years to come, to challenge the advocates of big government and doctrinaire liberalism to a battle of ideas. And that, when all is said and done, is the purpose of this Center for Public Affairs that bears John Ashbrook's name. John's friends miss him. His countrymen owe him a deep debt of gratitude. But here in Ashland, on this campus, at this center, we can and will keep his memory alive and repay that debt by holding high the flame of freedom and carrying on the battle that he dedicated his life to. Thank you all for letting me be a part of this.